Okay, good morning. Thank you for joining us uh, to the ROR meeting. Please sign the blue sheets. Okay, this meeting is under the not well. Please read carefully. Uh, okay, the meeting materials. This is the third part if you can join. Thank you very much to Dominic for being the, uh, the menu taker and Raul, Michael for the JavaScriber. Okay, this is our agenda for today. Some comments? We have two hours. Uh, okay, this is are the milestones. Uh, I think we are working kind of well on that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, okay, our active uh, internet draft. We are going to have some on discussion today. This is the related. We are going to have two from Georgia's today. Um, these are the open tickets. Um, three of them were consequence of the last meeting. Uh, like uh, we need a new version. No. Yes. Ah, yeah. Okay, we have uh, new new tickets consequence of the last meeting. Um, so if we need a new version of sixty five fifty, like uh, so, I think a Reaper observation draft is going to help to us for that. And if we need a new mode of operation for Ripple, and uh, if uh, we have to include CLBR as into the data root, I think uh, we should. Um, okay, Torles, if you want to join us for the next, for a discussion of the Royal mailing list, thank you. Oh no, I don't know if I can present with an X, was a square. How is it? Good morning. Um, oh, should it hold it? Hold it? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, can I? Yep. Yep. So, um, so this is about the um, uh, whole idea of using bit strings um, as addressing in role, and here is a little bit the. Um, marketing slide of what we um, are trying to achieve high level um, you know as, as something to to sell it to a user um, so the design team um, has the following email address so if you want to contribute please subscribe to it um, and um, it's a little bit too small to, to see it completely but uh, let me quickly try to to summarize what the goal is you have your um, role domain um, with the root node um, and you want to have efficient forwarding in here so you want to especially in the um, <coughs> stateless mode uh, be able to use the bits to route the packet all the way to a destination and then also one of the things you would like to be able to do is that um, an application can um, in a server 
indicate which receivers should receive a packet. And so the example used here is, let's say, a lightning control application where you have a large number of lights and the con controller application would like to be able to say for a particular command, switch on, switch off, um, which light should be switched on and off. Um, and in the classical IP multicast model, you don't have that option. Um, do you want to interrupt immediately or? Yeah, I just wanted to make a terminology mm -hmm. uh, comment. Yeah. Um, when you use the terms client and server, mm -hmm. you, are, you are trying to say small thing and big box. Um, All yeah, your slides or... are using the terms client and server, not as in client server communications, which is a request response scheme, but in the sense of things that are small and might be on batteries and things that are big and are in racks. Right. So, so, so whenever this is, you say right. server, you mean thing in a rack. Yeah. So this is this is a small ten thousand line of piece of software running somewhere, and these yeah. are you know all the lights in the hotel, whether they're small or large. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so the the this whole is, terminology is, is really confusing yeah. when you come out of a. An area where the servers are the small things and the clients yeah. are the big things in the red. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, let, uh, please let me know what the preferred terminology, let's say, on the application side is, and then we can adopt it. I've just, uh, you know, introduced in some slides down the terminology for the components, but yeah, we, uh, I don't know what the right terminology is at the application side. Um, so yeah, so that basically would be one of the things we've never done in, in, uh, in beer a working group proper so far, which is bringing the ability to set bits up to the application level and especially here in these control applications where the um, controlling software uh, would like to be able to, you know, for individual commands very quickly change the set of receivers. That would be really a very big benefit. Um, and the other, as I mentioned, is the um, power cost efficient forwarding higher compression by using the bits. Um, on this client and server thing, uh, servers have state, clients don't. Sorry, server servers have state, clients don't. That's where it comes from. So a light has a state; it's on or off, and the client has a procedure to turn the light on and off. That that's where it comes from. <laughs> well, maybe again, Simon Simon Slupik. Well, it would be maybe good to, to, to work out in the design team what terminology we want to use at the application level. Greg Shepard, Cisco, uh, on behalf of the Beer Working Group. Torvis, you mentioned that we haven't specified imposition in the application layer within mm -hmm. the working group. Architecturally, it's always been the yeah. intent, so I don't think there's anything omitting that. Mm -hmm. If you think we need to do something, you know, document something in a way that's unique to what the architecture is not cover, please bring that up because there's yeah. a lot of work in that space right now. Yeah. Not necessarily just here, it's kind of cropping up all over, like mm -hmm. you've seen uh, beers of service, mm -hmm. kind of same idea. There's also right. a data center work taking place like this. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're going to present, you're doing TE at the working group, right? Are you talking about this at all? No, no, not. The, the, that was just the, 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 the basic. So, okay, because I think this could come up as a, as a use case right. and maybe entered in the use case draft so we can track that. Yeah. And then if there is a gap in the architecture for host and position, yeah. please bring it up. By the way, much more fundamentally, and I think I forgot to put this into the slides, but I wouldn't like to have role do anything that should better be done in the beer working group. So anything on this API level for the application or so, I think should not be specific to role, but let us in the design team right. rather like, get far along to make that argument. And we'll pick it up. I mean, yeah. we're all big team here, right? We yeah. hug in. Good. Thanks. Um, yeah, Kasper, mm -hmm. on the, the terminology thing, um, there's also another pair of roles here, which is the sender and the receiver, or mm -hmm. the source and the member, right. uh, and so on. Then maybe we can focus on that terminology and not try to call the, the sender servers all the time and the receiver's clients. Right, that would be one level further down into the technology. That's a lot more easy, right? So the multicast sender. Mm -hmm. Uh, model where it's in control uh, about the set of receivers for each individual message that um, but yeah at, at the app we, we would still need to kind of talk about the application level um, you know how you build what is a controlling server and then these client devices so yeah okay so that was basically the idea to uh, to market the scope um, of the work um, but it's not only multicast but it's also meant to uh, support the efficient transmission of unicast and then, of course, uh, the cool thing coming over from the beer working group is we don't have to bother about the constraints of um, 
uh, working in ASICs uh, that support terabits of bandwidth rather the opposite. Um, so everything is software in the forwarding that, you know, for us coming from the beer working group is a complete shift because what was done over there was very much focused on supporting ASICs. So here is a little bit um, the the first round of uh, trying to come up with a, a short-term terminology for the components involved. Um, so we would have um, these the software or boxes, the server, and I call this six server node um, application. It wouldn't be running uh, Roland Beer, but it would need to be able to send um, packets um, where the beer bit strings or an equivalent like the set of receivers would be able to be indicated so that um, this new model of the multicast would be uh, accessible to that application server. Um, then the root node um, that would basically be one of the roles of these blue boxes which are um, the uh, ripple routers. So 6RR as a proposed term for the root. Um, 6TR would be a transit node uh, that doesn't necessarily have to have a bit in um, uh, the, the beer string, so it wouldn't necessarily have to be a um, receiver. Um, in beer, this is just called a, a BFR, be a forwarding router. And then 6LR would be the leaf, the receiver router, which has a bit, which can act as a receiver, which you can explicitly address. Um, and then also... Um, Pascal brought up the need that we also want to support um, even more lightweight nodes that wouldn't be part of the routing domain, that would just be hosts, um, receivers that um, just uh, would, and that I think is the conclusion that we're reaching so far, would just be receive, able to receive IP multicast, but wouldn't have the feature of being directly addressed by bits. So that's basically, you know, the current state of, of the overall architecture. And then that means there are two types of applications, right? One is the beer aware application that um, <clears throat> does know it's addressed through a bit. And then basically the applications here that would only be able to see IP multicast. Greg. Uh, Greg again, Cisco. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this, and maybe we should pull this offline if I got to dig in deeper. But you've got bit assignments to links like TE and bit assignments to nodes like traditional beer. Yeah. I'll, and mm -hmm. the, I'll, no, no modification of the forwarding paradigm for that to work? I haven't thought of We'll get to it. Pardon me? We'll get to it. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Are the expectation of six LNs are also bit assigned? Or is that just. No, that was exactly the idea that at this point in time, we wanted to make sure that we can support two different type of nodes, one that would be part of the beer domain, right. and then one that wouldn't be part of the beer domain that would just be um, accessing the unicast yeah. and multicast right. services I, I of the that. domain. I got that. Being part of the beer domain doesn't necessarily mean it's got a bit assignment. Right. So at this point in time, we would cut it down because the whole you know exercise right now is to cut down to figure out the you know, minimum gotcha. delivery. Right. So but let's not do... But the egress the interface could be enough to specify that device. It doesn't have to be the device assigned a bit, is my point. Right, right. Yes, right. There, there, there could be direct addressing to bits for them, but maybe the, the point right now would be let's cut that option off. Okay. Let's keep that option to the full uh, Ripple uh, beer routers. Yeah. So this was my kind of first attempt. We haven't reviewed, uh, find, found time to review it in the design team of how I could see um, the forwarding plane. And uh, in beer working group proper, we have... Um, some differentiation, which I'm going to talk about uh, in the beer working group about the beer TE forwarding and the beer forwarding. And now we have here in um, the uh, roll side, um, we have one big differentiation over what we've done in uh, beer, which is that we wanted to introduce also the ability to have lossy compressed bloom filter for based forwarding versus the explicit forwarding. Um, and uh, so there are a bunch of uh, issues to work through that are detailed in further slides. Um, but on the forwarding side, really, um, maybe we could think about it in this simplified uh, manner where no distinction between... I actually think I missed one update here. I think I sent... There... Okay, yeah. So I thought I had written something here, but... Um, so the, the interesting idea here was that we may not need any distinction in the forwarding plane um, between the TE uh, notion and uh, the native beer notion because in the end the only thing we're trying to do is you have a bit for that bit you're trying to figure out where to send a copy 
What is your next hop? The question is, how is the next hop calculated, right? In the BRTE model, the next hop comes from an explicit assignment in the controller and would be different um, on every node, whereas in beer proper, it's calculated locally from the routing table, the next hop, right? So that, that fundamentally means that the control plane could be different, um, but hopefully we can come up with a forwarding plane, which we call, you know, beer forwarding table, um, that wouldn't have to distinguish between beer and beer TE. Now there is one more key thing which for which I have all these crazy not finished slides, which is that in beer proper, we're resetting bits. And the resetting of the bits is something we're doing in beer and beer TE for different purposes. Um, that's detailed in, in, in the further slides. Um, so I've basically put these resets bit in here, but we also know we can't do the reset of the bits when we're compressing um, the bit string in a lossy fashion. So here we wouldn't have it. And the question also in um, the non-compressed forwarding is whether we wanna have this reset bit mask because it may be, um, if we don't compress it, it may be fairly expensive, right? So if we have a bit string um, table of 256 bit, let's say, this is kind of here the example, then every forwarding entry would need to have, of course, the, they could be compressed, right? But if we look at uncompressed, we have 256 by 256 bit for the reset uh, bit strings for, for these uh, FBMs, um, forwarding bit mask, which are basically resetting the bits. Um, and maybe that is too much state, so we don't want to have it from the state perspective. Now, they, they could be very well compressed, right? So, but in any case, this is kind of the current state of the slide, um, of the slide, not, <laughs> right? Um, Pascal. Yes, Pascal Tuber here. Uh, I, I mean, we, we, have, we have documents from which we started this work right before this design team formed. And I think it was pretty clear in every document that we never need to reset, the, reset any bit. Okay. Um, and, and if you see a need, then you need to come up with it and, and justify it with a group or well, design team. But so far, there was there's no need to reset those bits. When, one of the big reasons why mm -hmm. Pierre would reset those bits is to avoid loops because this thing gets flooded. But in uh, Ripple, it goes down a DODAC. And it's a nice property of the DODAC that you, know, you can only go down it if you start going down. I mean, you will never loop. And so, so there, is, there is no need to reset the bits. So is that, that I know, right. right? So if you if you see another good reason, then come up and we'll discuss. But no, I so think I think we primarily we need to be very explicit in documenting the the reasons why we're getting rid of um, the reset. And I wanted to make sure that we you know enlist and document them correctly, right? Because so far I'm not sure that we have actually done that work. Okay, and then then for Greg because I will get the benefit of Greg being here, and and you know the draft, right? We we have we have a, another draft which has nothing to do with this work of so little so far, which is about uh, in the T world managing duplicates and and replication and finding out which transmissions failed, and that's going to be very very useful in the wireless space. Um, I mean you've pre you've presented the draft at beer, I guess I I, I had a collision, but yeah yeah. And, and so, um, actually, Thursday, we'll have a bar buff that I call POW for predictable and available wireless. And this is the sort of work which would be useful for POW. So the buff is at 11, and we don't have a room yet. But if, if you want to attend, because you're not, are you on the dead net list? I don't think so. I copied six dish, I copied six low, I copied dead net. Now, if, if, if you just drop me an email, you want to, to see what Poe is, is doing, then please just drop me an email. I will uh, add you to the list. Okay. So, but but the, this, so in this case, we do need to reset bits, but it's a very particular operation. It's not at all this design here. In this design here, we go down the DODAG, we don't reset the bits. Right. Let's, I mean, there, and, 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 and these are, you know, not really finished slides for. Um, uh, for, for th these are working slides, right? By the way, there there is a, a, a version update missing, so I'd already replaced all six low pen with six low RH in in the slide deck that I thought I'd sent you. So sorry for for the mistake. So basically, um, the kind of encapsulation that we're planning to use. Um, yeah, there are slides missing. I had a slide here that that is crazy. So because I had I had a slide with, with all the relevant documents, including um, Pascal's six low 
uh, document for, for, for the encapsulation option um, that would compress um, the beer header and then also the um, uh, encapsulated IP packet. Yeah, these, these are complete wrong. The, these, oh, man, it's that really nasty. Um, so, right, so um, <clears throat> this, this was just, you know, um, the reasoning why even, you know, Pascal is saying that we don't have to reset the bit string, right? But um, even more so if we have the bloom filters, we cannot reset them. Um, and... Uh. I could, yeah. Okay, I got this one. Okay. Didn't change that much, but there was just kind of two or three. Yeah, I should be able to Right, so I, I think the question of where do we have duplicates and or loops, right? So in the in normal IGPs, we're saying we have micro loops, right? So and we wanted to avoid um, creating duplicates and uh, problems there um, with with the reset. Right, so are you say, Pascal? Are you saying that, for example, because of the way Ripple works, we would never have micro loops? Pascal, in summary, yes. Um, in practice, in Ripple, we have an additional header, which allows us to f to track if we are going up or down the structure. And we have we have this rule which says that if you're going down, you cannot go up again. And even if the nodes are um, not in sync in the routing table, they still have a sense of up and down and, and, and the mismatch is found. And so the packet will never loop. Um, th there are, the routing table themselves can indicate a loop, but the, 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 the packet as they follow this loop will discover that they are having a problem. So we would the, implicitly the relationship of is right. not what, what expected in the loop, so. So we would implicitly ignore bits that would have us go up again Basically, yes. I mean, the, the bits the bits is kind of a match, right? You you you've got some bits which match match next to a child, and so you 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 go through your children and you, you kind of end the bits which identify this next hub. Uh, so all all the routes which go through this guy if it's storing okay. mode or this link if it's non-storing mode, and and you, it could be a bloom. And so you end the packet and this thing, and that gives right. you whether this child or not is the next hub. Right, so we basically would have a local um, reset mask, so to speak, to to that that would be populated from the routing table, excluding the bits that are not quote down from here. Yes, for each yeah. child, you need to have the bitmap of what's relevant to be sent right. through this child, right. and you could reset the bits. But no, just ending the the, the end with the bits of interest that I think yes, is the relevant. Yes, the bit yeah. of interest per child. So that, that's what makes this so great in storing mode, because now your routing table is just a set of bits per child, as opposed to a route per leaf. Right. right. OK, so we need, we need to correctly capture that and um, also look into what the memory impact is of that implicit, you know, end mask. Um, but I think that that sounds more like it's, not, it's, it's a per node reset mask. It's not per bit. So I think that should be fine. No, it basically your particular Ripple node. So you're doing an end operation before you're even looking at the bits. You're ending to to, to figure out which bits you want to look at. Yeah. Your routing table in storing mode looks like you have a state per child in the DODAG, right? Mm -hmm. And this state is kind of the bits, which are below this guy. That, that would be stateful. That's in storing mode. Right. In non-storing mode, the, you have a bit per interface, which is, well, anyway, it's per adjacency, right? So, so whether it's the same wire or wireless, or if, if it's multiple different interfaces, you don't really care. You, you have a bit per 
uh, adjacency, a bit a bit mask per adjacency. In non-storing, that bit mask will be basically the bloom filter of this link, mm. or the, the bit of this link if you're not using bloom filters. And in storing mode, it's going to be the collection of all the bits of all the leaves, which are somewhere down the diodac via this guy. Anyway, you take the bit mask, in your, the bits in your packet, you end that mm -hmm. with okay. the, the, the state you have for that child. If the end operation is not a zero, you mm -hmm. have a match. If you have a match, you're four. Okay. So let's 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 fix that up accordingly. I think we're running completely out of yeah. time. It's already nine twenty-five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Cosmo, a quick question. I'm a bit confused about those bits because this is a graph, not a tree. Um, so at, at some point, somebody lower in the tree needs to find out whether somebody more up in the tree has assigned the, the lower tree a forwarding responsibility or not. And if you never reset bits, then, then multiple paths down that. I'm not 100% well, persuaded either, but I think we're running we'll, out of we'll, time for yeah, that yeah, piece. But we'll I wanted to make sure that we really work through about this. Yes. Loops, but yes. It's, it's also about yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So, but this was the slide that I was missing, right? Specifically, just to to figure out if I have the complete understanding of the documents that have been written for the scope of this work here, right? So uh, Pascal has the, you know, um, his proposed architecture. Purely the uh, beer and roll level, not the you know IP multicast overlay. Um, Karsten has uh, the roll C cast, which uh, talks purely about the solution assuming IP multicast on top of it for the bloom filters. There is uh, uh, Pascal's beer dispatch in six low, which talks about the six low RH uh, extensions for beer, to the best of my understanding. And um, then the unaware leaves is I th is that related to basically these these nodes that are supposed to not be doing um, so this this I think starts this work it's not meant to you know define right now the multicast part of it right. yeah so so that would basically be the part of these leaves um, that should be very lightweight don't have any knowledge about roll and beer um, but would also need to get IP multicast through um, roll beer then. And then, yeah, so please, if there's anything more drafts, uh, please let me know so that I keep uh, the, the, the list of relevant documents. So, um, right. Um, so there, there are a lot of things here, and, and I think I was trying to, yeah. So we're trying to continue limit the work scope by eliminating below the line or it doesn't work um, options, and I have more detailed slide on those. Um, so I think uh, the first consideration was even when we want to address um, receivers directly with bits from the server application, we could still put everything into an IP multicast header because that one would be compressed by six low RH anyhow. And you know we already have socket API, so it helps a lot if we don't at this point in time try to figure out how to receive native beer packets that don't have IP multicast in them. I was first afraid of the overhead of IP multicast when we don't need it, but you know that would be the proposal of just thinking that the stack always has an IP multicast header and that we're appropriately compressing that with a six low RH. Then we did discuss to an extent how we can basically um, uh, send packets optimally. I, uh, I was thinking faked IP packets where we don't have an IP multicast destination, um, and we figured out that we don't want to do it, right? So remember all these discussions that, that we had when um, we're multicasting a unicast packet and figured out that's not something we really want to do because there are so many problems. Pascal, yes, so just the, the, the primary is if you want to send the same packet to multiple unicast destinations, you've mm -hmm. got this exactly. problem of uh, rec well, you could reconstruct the IP destination based on a bit. That would be easy, but the problem would be the UDP checksum. Exactly. And and so we decided that for multicast, we, you 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 we would not use a bit to indicate a, a destination and set multiple bits at the same time, because then it would for be unicast. different packets. 
for Unicast. But for Unicast, we could send one Unicast to one person, and we could see the bit as a compression of the IP address. That's right. very so, rich. So I think I think you said a little bit wrong. So if we send an IP Unicast packet across um, this beer ripple solution, then you can only have said one bit exactly. to indicate a destination. One bit only we support. That's what right. I don't find here. Now, of course, there can still be false positives, but they would be recognized as false positives because of the IP Unicast destination address, right? Only one node is supposed to have that IP Unicast destination address. Even if we use a Bloom, actually, because if the Bloom gives delivers to two destinations, right. if, if the checksum is still part of the packet, that can be recognized. Right. The, the, the right, exactly. So I'm saying that even if a packet gets delivered to a unicast packet, gets delivered to more than one destination, it would be discarded by all but the one right destination. So we're not changing the unicast semantic. True? You would have said it differently? I'm trying to discuss okay. this. We need a day for this. Yeah. Oh. That's fine. We can, we, can, we can think about, you know, an interim we have more time right and then uh, i think what um then basically i think what i was saying here about the transport i don't want to bring in the definition of pascal right now but i think that was basically the conclusion that we look into this transport mode only for the uh, be a ripple routers and tunnel mode to the uh, um, uh, lightweight nodes and then i think one of the open questions is um where exactly do we want to have the destination semantic, right? Because is it really worthwhile right now to consider um, this for the storing mode, where we kind of you know summarize the benefit of the storing mode? Because I think primarily we're looking into the non-storing mode. No, nope. I think we're going we were going back and forth on that. So beer is critical for storing mode. Mm -hmm. because it allows you to save a lot of state. I mean, it, it okay. basically, it allows storing mode in constrained devices. I mean, Karsten has been telling us so many times that he has never seen any storing mode mm -hmm. Ripple network in IoT, right? I okay. mean, I've seen them in non-IoT because it's a routing protocol. You can use it everywhere. We ship it mm -hmm. with storing mode so with Cisco. But in, in IoT, you usually don't see it because mm -hmm. of the load of information you have to store. That's because it's one, at least one address per leaf in your DODAG. Okay. With beer, storing mode becomes, becomes feasible because it's one bitmap per child. Okay, and that's fine, but so, that's, so let's, let's write that down then correctly because I think that value mode. proposition wasn't clearly laid out. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's critical. I think yeah. for me, it's a lot more interesting in storing mode because mm -hmm. it makes such a huge difference. It becomes feasible. Okay. Good. Michael Richardson. So if I understood, Pascal, what you said is that beer reduces the cost of uh, routing entries in storing mode to such that it's now low enough that it may be workable, but it doesn't, it does not change the order in um, uh, dependency that storing mode has. It just reduces the constant significantly. That, that not, not true? Whereas non-storing mode has no, the, the individual nodes have no specific uh, limit on how many they can support because they're not storing any any content per per node. Uh, I, 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 you still need to have information per leaf, but the point is, if 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 you have sized your bitmap to say 256, just for this example, because you know your network is going to be 256 or something. Um, then you need one of such bitmap per child, regardless of how many leaves you have. Now, you cannot have more than 256 leaves because that's the size of your bitmap, right? If you want to go beyond that, then, then you, you have the, the, if you want some elasticity, that's why you use blue. But then, then the, the more you extend this elasticity, the more false positive you're gonna get. Well, in, in the traditional networks that we build, they are not so big that, I mean, usually we build like 30 devices in the network, right? Uh, and, and so 256 is already a very big network. Oh, T, I was not talking T right now. I was talking, mm -hmm. storing mode is non-T, is normal beer routing. That's when you have state that you yeah, look I at mean, this bit, this do we Do we want to, I mean, because, 
this at the core of the work. Um, and I think, you know. Uh, yeah, did, uh, Carsten, I just wanted to point out two things. First, there is a small slate of hand here because uh, by limiting the thing to 256, of course, we make story mode much more manageable. And then by, by reducing the state by a factor, factor of 64, we also gain something. Um, the, the other answer is um, the Bloom filter is, is uh, uh, one important parameter for a Bloom filter is how many uh, uh, members you actually have to, uh, in the whole group. So if you have uh, sparse groups, you can address uh, the whole network with a pretty small filter. If you have dense groups, you need larger filters. I mean, if your group is 100%, you only need one bit, send it to everyone. But uh, if you have dense groups, your filters get right. But let's go back. So let me say what I just want to make sure is that for every option that we're saying we want to work on, let's make sure we have sufficiently agreed upon value proposition, right? And I, I think this discussion was good. It, I think, showed that that is necessary and that I think we should reconverge, for example, on exactly the value proposition Pascal claims for the beer mode. So I, I had started here to kind of look at, you know, the stacking, how this stuff uh, works. Um, probably not correct here, but um, this is basically what, 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 what I think we would need to work out. So this was the IP multicast over roll beer um, toward, um, in this case, a 6LN, right? So in this case, we have the server application. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in this section that's saying IP multicast should mean SSM, really. Um, so then basically there should, we should be able to have a user level SDK that the whole stuff can be written at user level that, you know, on the application server, we can just send things into, let's say UDP tunnel, which is typically the encapsulation we can do at, um, application layer, um, that would have to end up at the root node. Um, and then from there on, we would have the hop by hop forwarding beer, beer TE. Um, and then basically on the six LR node where the bit is set, um, it would basically be uncompressed, must be compressed as a non bit string multicast packet again gets into the six LN application, right? So that was kind of a little bit the starting point of these are the type of diagrams I think we need to work through the end to end uh, solution and the stacking of pieces. And to me, the core part is really also understanding the six low RH kind of how small these headers can become with the bit strings um, and compressing the IP multicast overhead away. So the unicast stuff wasn't done. This was all these um, consideration, I think running out of time. Um, yeah, these were the things that we think uh, wasn't working. And um, yeah, so I basically started to write down the multicast layer. Um, and um, yeah, so um, yeah, so <laughs> way too much text, but um, I think one of the discussions we're having in the multicast architecture side in the ITF overall is, can we do things more efficiently, better with SSM only? And yet now, obviously, that's, you know, one of the things I wanted to review. If that's sufficient enough, if we're, you know, requiring IGMP v or MLD v2 with SSM indicating the source. And the key part um, to cut to the chase here, why I think SSM would be highly uh, valuable for um, this type of solution is because the source address in the membership join could exactly indicate the unicast address of the server so that we don't need to have an in-network discovery which server is basically responsible for particular uh, clients to receive multicast packets sent by a particular server because that would otherwise be the typical ASM issue um, that we have multiple application servers for different clients. They all send multicast and you need to start assigning IP multicast uh, group addresses to different applications. So you can forego this complexity when we're also adopting SSM as the mandatory multicast delivery mechanism. That was kind of the high level and this is all details. Carson? Yeah, I, I have um, one comment on, mm -hmm. on choosing SSM. Um, in, in a single Ripple domain, mm -hmm. of course, the source is always the root. So it, it's... Uh, no, not uh, no, that's why yeah. I brought up so, the, the prior so slide. That, there would be different application servers that are actually... They are not servers. Uh, that's, that's why you now can steal that and use it for something else which is an interesting idea I haven't thought about much mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. But basically, the, the reason why Multicast has, has SSM is to solve the, the rendezvous problem. And since everything has to go through the route, we don't have that problem. 
No, I, I yep. <laughs> well, um, no, I think, but the, the rendezvous point is primarily overhead in administration and pain for the network operator. It's not an yeah. application level issue, right? So the application this, level issue is uh, uh, kind of indicating which source am I wanting to get traffic from, right? Now, yeah, and as you the, said, we can nicely abuse that to basically have the server source discovery built from the application level that way. Okay, I have to think about that. Mm -hmm. The point I was really going to make is um, the, the whole thing seems to assume that the whole group is within one Ripple domain. And th that's not IP multicast anyway. So let, we have all freedoms of the world to, to uh, design something completely new here because mm -hmm. we are not sure. doing IP multicast in the original sense. No, that's true, but the more I can avoid having to, you know, do something new in host stack of hundreds of different, um, you know, client OSs. I mean, IGMP v3 itself took uh, uh, 12 years to get adopted everywhere, right? So yeah, I don't know what, what the client is, but the, the, the guy up there who sends the data right. is going to use a UDP tunnel to the root. Anyway. Exactly. So that that's where I definitely want to have a solution where we have no OS changes, no offense meant to, yeah. you know. So we have a completely oh, blank just, slate and yeah. can design something right. that we really but like. But on the client side, I think we should be very careful about how basically Whatever they would receive packets and, and also make sure that we don't need OS changes there, as, especially on the 6LR, the ones that don't have uh, any Ripple beer functionality. Okay. Uh, Greg. Again, I'm going to avoid that last piece, but just going back for clarification, um, if the intent with SSM is to use it to identify one of n number of, of servers for source discovery, that makes a lot of sense. But don't forget the, the discussions around an RP or, or moot mm -hmm. with, with beer. Sure. In fact, beer doesn't care if it's ASM or SSM and actually uh, becomes effectively the beer domain is like a virtual RP. So if you need to do some sort of redundancy or you needed to have some sort of multiple source, you know, the, the argument on the RP is it, let's no. just avoid that and stay yeah. logically within the architecture. Yeah. No, I wasn't making the argument about the RP. Okay. Carson was making the argument. I think the argument that you made afterwards that we might have multiple domains and need to figure out how an application right. works across no it, I think that's more important uh, to understand. Okay, thanks. Um, I tend to agree with Kirsten on a lot of what he said. We, we have a, uh, a new environment here that, mm -hmm. and uh, there are things that we prefer doing and things we, we less prefer using. Mm -hmm. uh, injecting an address which comes from outside the Ripple domain is very costly to us. Mm -hmm. um, we would not like to see it in the packet if we can avoid it because we need to compress it or if we don't compress it, 16 bits in the air, 16 bytes in the air. So for instance, having every multicast packet sourced at the root for us can be compressed with 6 rh to one bit. Yeah. Right, because it come, comes from the root bit, mm -hmm. you know. So, so that's very efficient. So if every multicast packet which is compressed this way can be sourced at the root and this destination set of bits, then we have the most efficient compression. My argument would be that the amount of state that I think I need here in the last hop uh, uh, Ripple router is the same that I would need for the clients having unicast IP traffic to a particular application server. So if to, you know, improve the performance of the system, all these application servers should use the IP address of the root node so that basically you don't have to keep state for new IP unicast addresses. That's fine with me. That doesn't change the concept, right? And, and the other thing that we could leverage is the fact that we have multiple instances in repo. So you could, you could have the same mm -hmm. multicast address which can be derived into different Okay. Anyhow, so that was kind of, I think, where we should stop here. Hmm? Yeah. Um, there was a mention of uh, reserving the day. There was the mention of reserving a day. But for um, uh, discussing all this, I think I agree. Because one hour, yeah. even two hours, may be a bit short. So what about uh, having a uh, half day or a day at the next yeah. ITF meeting? Oh, yeah. Friday, yeah. Friday. So this, Friday, yeah. Uh, well, no, unfortunately, I'm in uh, some other place. I have to leave on Wednesday night. So that, uh, I thought yeah. that was out. Yeah. yeah. But no, I'll, I'll basically resend after all these daylight saving times, uh, just the weekly meeting stuff, and then we can discuss uh, in, in, a, in a weekly meeting if we want to have an interim um, uh, with longer time. How about that? Might be feasible. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, everybody, if people are interested in doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, 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 I still like to have a couple of weeks to, you know, bring this into shape that we have the different components really clearly yep. uh, laid out to work Absolutely. on. Absolutely. 
Yes, Greg. I just want to vote publicly that Monroe was advanced and successful Yes. Yeah, that's the good uh, interim. I'm not sure. I mean, there are also the WebEx interims. I, 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 I wish we could do an in-person interim, but I'm not sure if we find an opportunity for that. Okay. So we, we need to go into the joint vote and other progress. Okay, and we'll discuss this on the mailing list then. So we see how many days if we have an interim apart from or next to the next ITF. Okay. Fine. Thank you very much for all the work. I'm happy that this progress in. Next round. Hello, I'm Rahul Jadav. Uh, this is a quick update about what's happening with the efficient route invalidation draft. Uh, we uh, that we have sorry. Okay. So we have uh, we had received a lot of comments uh, from Peter, from Liu Bing, from uh, Georgius. Uh, thank you. And most of the updates are based on that. So. Okay. So this is the first one I'm presenting. So one of the one of the major changes that has been done, or one of the things that has been explained more, is related to how to handle multiple parents. So Ripple has this notion that you can have multipath routing. You can send the same DAO to multiple parents, and in such a case, how will DCO or the DCO handle the route invalidation? This is ex explained with an example. Uh, so this is the major update. Uh, other updates, we, we are more in line with the security considerations of 65, uh, 6550, <clears throat> especially there are three modes of security and secured, on, uh, authenticated, and pre-installed. So we have aligned our draft uh, in the security consideration as to how uh, these three points, uh, these three modes are to be uh, understood. Uh, then there are some clarification, the deco sequence number, choosing the initial value, some terminology, especially the the, requ the tolerant to link failures. So this is this is the section title we had used, and this caused a lot of confusion. We had to reword the whole thing based on the comments from uh, Peter and uh, judges. Uh, then the terminology, we had made a consistent use of terminology. We had made some duplicate text in this document from Ripple and Sixlow, so as to just make it more readable. Thank you, Peter, and everyone else, uh, including Pascal, Georgios, and Lubing for the review comments. I'll quickly move on to my next slide, which is the Ripple observation. Now, this is... Uh, just want to mention that for me, this document is finished, and we'll send it all now for, for publication. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to the next presentation, right? Okay, so uh, this is the draft which talks about most of the most of the observations that we had while 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 developing a solution around Ripple uh, for metering solution. Uh, having said that, it's not now limited only to the metering metering solution, uh, but more uh, more other problems as well. So uh, this working this document was adopted. But uh, we have clearly mentioned in the document that maybe this document might not get published. We want to still keep this document around so that if anyone ends up fixing this issue in some other way, this could pr prove to be like a reference material. material. And this can expl this explains the problem in more details. Like it gives stepwise uh, explanation of what the problem is. OK, so uh, there had been a big discussion on whether DTSN is a lollipop counter or no. Uh, look, most of the things I'm going to repeat from the last presentation, so yeah. Uh, uh, this is in continuation to what we had presented before. Whether DTSN is a lollipop counter or no. Now, implementations are clearly confused about it. We have two implementations making use of different, uh, uh, I mean, di different notions. Basically, Contiki is using DTSN as a lollipop counter, and Riot is not. And this is going to, I mean, this will have issues on interoperability. Uh, so we had a big discussion on the mailing list. Eventually, we realized that maybe DTSN could be a lollipop counter, or the, there are pros and cons with each of the approach. Primary problem with using a lollipop counter is that within the linear part of this lollipop counter, you have to maintain the state in a persistent storage. Now, this this problem is in general with all the lollipop counters, including uh, DTS and DAO sequence. Or uh, uh, no, not DAO sequence is not a uh, lollipop counter, but all the other sequence uh, numbers. The problem is for the linear part, you have to maintain the state in the persistent storage. Now we have an application which 
is a very minimalistic application and you just are hosting that application in a mesh network now you have this cost of keeping the data in the persistent storage now will a deployment afford this cost can this cost be mitigated by using some sort of signaling tech, uh, signaling mechanism this is what we are checking if it is possible michael okay so the next slide is about the dtsn so we had a discussion right uh, the primary problem with uh, non -st uh, storing mode is the memory efficiency on 6lrs but there are other issues that we found we we, we observed while deploying storing mode of operation and dtsn tends to be one of the major i mean the way dtsn ha is handled eventually decides what kind of control overhead you have in the network so dtsn is dao trigger sequence number essentially what it means is whenever a new dtsn is received by the 6lr it will in turn generate its 6lr or 6ln it will in turn generate its own dao so what happens is when in in case of parent switching node switching should the dtsn be incremented should uh, uh, so the first imp uh, implementer's dilemma is that should the dtsn be incremented with every dio trigger, trigger timer if it is not incremented with regards to dio trigger timer then we don't have enough dao redundancy now there is another problem with regards to dao that the acknowledgement mechanism of dao which i'm going to present in the subsequent slide because of that issue we cannot really increment uh, we cannot afford to not increment dtsn on every dio trigger timer and you can see implementation struggling with that if you if you actually see so contiki initially decided to use uh, <laughs> increment the dtsn in every di trackal then it was a lo lot of control over it and then they decided to remove it so clearly there is there is some room for clarification or maybe a text saying how to uh, handle it okay uh, yeah so the, the the second point here is during parent switch should node increments a dtsn should the 6lr increments a dtsn now this is important because now the route update for the sub do dag rooted at that particular 6lr has to be updated now uh, let's say for example So uh, during parent switch, also the same procedure. The, the primary problem with during parent switch, if the 6LR which is switching, if it increments a DTSN, the question is, are the 6LRs downstream should also increment it or not? If it don't, if they don't increment, then how would how how would the route updation for all the subdo deck take into uh, will be handled? Now one solution is that the 6LR which is switching also has the complete routing table and it can push all the information. So that is most likely the the way to handle it but yeah i mean this this these are some things which i feel maybe maybe clarified in the text somewhere yeah oh hello so i completely agree with pascal here i completely agree with how that we have to clarify those things um just for history, it was a huge fight within Ripple. Some people were for the pool model, like DTSN pools, you know, the, the DAO state to the parrot. And there are cases where you want this pool, just like when you repair it. And some people said, you know, we, we can be lazy. Those networks, you know, they work when they work. And so, so the, the child should be free of sending DAO anytime. And so there is no restriction when the child sends a DAO. So even if you don't increment the DTSN each time you trickle, if you don't do that, then you have the expectation that anyway, the children soon enough on their own will decide to trigger a DAO. So the, the, the basic spec doesn't tell you that. And, and it's probably because we, we, we could not agree and we really did not know if there would be use cases for Ripple where the push model, the, the child pushes the DAO periodically whenever it likes. Or the pool model where the parent pulls with a new DTSN all the DAO from the children. Which one was the right model? for which use case. We were not clear, right? Ripple was there before we had enough experience. So we left that open. So what Raul is telling us is, is now we need to be more specific. Uh, is there a, a type of use case where one applies, the other applies, what benefits of each model, etc. I mean, Ripple is fat enough like this. We didn't have much text on that, but it, this is a great, great discussion to have. And you know, at some point, Ripple will be implemented in some vertical 
uh, standards like I don't know DVA or whatever else. And and when you implement an RFC in a, an alliance standard, then you, you actually say I'm using this feature, this feature, this feature like this. So they will this. Today, the design is like, they will have to decide if they want to push, pull, or do both, what kind of timers you have for sending DAO, what kinds of, uh, when do you trigger the DTS, etc. It doesn't have to be the same for every particular alliance standards for every particular vertical industry. We don't know that there is a good answer for everybody. If we knew, then we, have, we would have written it in report. So, so Michael Richardson here, and we have microphones. I didn't know we had local AV support. That's wonderful. Um, so, um, um, so we could have, we should have, as Pascal just said, some things. Um, I'm not really fond of alliance profiles because I just, I just think they're dumb. But um, uh, we have the applicability statements that we wrote, um, and clearly this is something we should have should have covered about push pull and this kind of stuff. If that was a clearly articulated option, and I don't think in 6550 that's clearly articulated that there's two models. Rather, here's some. Here's some tools, put them together in some mm -hmm. way, right? So um, I, I've advocated this before, and I'm kind of a bit lost as to why we're not further down. And I said that to you last week, right? Um, this should be a draft. We were talking about leaving the observations as a collection. And I would really like you to pull that text out, this text about this thing out into a single draft that we can you know, okay. get consensus on and it'll be update 6550. I don't think we're ready to do this. I think we should have three or four clear updates right. before okay. we try to revise it. Um, and I mean, if we were to do this, just aside, one of the things we probably would rip out is all the security part because mm -hmm. no one's implemented it. Okay. However, that statement is no longer true. <laughs> I've learned that someone has implemented the, the security parts of <laughs> Ripple. And uh, so that's kind of interesting. So, so I'm glad we haven't started this because we would have, uh, mm. um, I, I that's think it's right. still important. But I would really like this to be in there. And there are other observations. Are you going on to those other ones now? Yes, yes, yeah, okay. yes, we are. So the other observation is with regards to the acknowledgement handling. Uh, there are multiple interpretations already, and there are different implementations with different impl interpretations. Uh, one is the hop by hop acknowledgement. So in this case, the acknowledgement is immediately sent by the receiving 6LR. There is a, so, so, so what happens is if, if, if the acknowledgement is sent here and then the acknowledgement is sent above, like for example, N1 sends it to border router or some other 6LR, if it gets rejected, then there is no way of informing the, uh, the, the, the 6LR node downstream whether, uh, that the DAO has been rejected. So there's no way. So this, this is much, much easier to implement. The primary reason why DAO ACK is needed is so that an application on the node or the node knows that it has connected in the in the whole network and that it can start its application traffic. What I'm trying to say is the current ac acknowledgement mechanism doesn't help you with that. And the, there has been a lot of debate on this, but so uh, so Conteki initially implemented this, then went on to this uh, style of uh, ACKing, which allowed like N N N2 will send the DAO to N1 and N1 won't respond back with an acknowledgement immediately. It will wait for the above upstream parent to send back the uh, acknowledgement and then uh, send an acknowledgement in response. So uh, this model is okay, but it has it, it has issues like in terms of it has to maintain state. It has to maintain state for a long time, and that is that is costly. Another in interpretation. Now this the, 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 this discussion I had with Pascal. So one of the things that he mentioned was that whenever an upstream node takes up a DAO, it accepts the responsibility of pushing the DAO all the way upstream. Well, and if it sends an acknowledgement downstream, it means that it the DAO will reach upstream. Well, well, it, the the problem with this approach is that if if there is a negative acknowledgement anywhere upstream. This, this node doesn't know that there will be a negative acknowledgement upstream. So it's not possible for, uh, for, for this node to eventually uh, negative ACK because positive ACK has already been sent for them. Right. So, so two things. Uh, first, I, I tried to, to get from the Contiki people, but they are not in the room right now, uh, why they did that. They said, oh, it's a hack they made for a particular customer. So yeah, because they're actually shipping their code and there are actually products being built out of that. And I think this one was for intelligent power plugs or something. And they, they, 
they really wanted to have like a very quick acknowledgement. And so it's a very particular use case where this behavior kind of works. Uh, in the generic case, I don't believe it would work just because of scalability, your timers, or all those things, right? So, so don't, um, it's, it's, I don't think it's right to say that Kantiki understood this. It's just that they knowingly did that hack for a particular use case where it was actually better for them, easier, and to just do the trick m more nicely, right? So, so the design on the left is the official one in repo. And like you say, the, the, the official thing is, you take responsibility, meaning you take it to the yield. If you can't, if you if you push it to your parent and your parent cannot accept it, you have to reparent. You, and if you're completely broken, then you 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 have to poison. And so so it's it's wrong to say that the child will never know. Either the parent will handle the responsibility and push it, or it will detach. It, will, it, it, it might find a new parent and push it through that new parent. And even if that fails, then it will completely have to detach because now it cannot handle its rotten. Right. right? So, so the, the whole point is, yes, you you can you have methods to accept the responsibility and, and ensure it won't just stay there. Right. Something will happen. So, 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 so the method that you just described it actually requires a lot of state again, because now while the parent switching is in progress, and if you are ho holding the DAO information, that means you'll have to you'll have to keep it with you for a longer time. You, you're supposed to keep a state for every DAO you have, not in any sequence, right? But every, every child, every address, you have a state and you have to know if your parent is aware of it, that's one bit. Uh, you, you have to track right. what your parent acknowledged okay, and what okay. it did not. And you retry what your parent did not acknowledge till the point where it did. And, and that's, that's part of storing mode. I mean, that is, I don't think it's additional state. It's just what you have to do if you have acknowledgements. Right. So, yeah. But the, I get that point. So basically what you're saying is the routing table already has that information along with the state. So which, uh, it, it, and we can have a flag saying that this has not been sent you're upstream. Synchronizing Key. with your parent kind of, right? That's part right. of repo storing mode. The hack is, oh, I'm synchronized with them. So, so when you have this DAO that you got from a child and it's not yet acknowledged by your parent, you need to know about this. There must be a bit somewhere which says that. Your okay. implementation. But what about the, for, the problem that we faced is, let's say, for example, the acknowledgement is received by N6 N6, and the application traffic is going to get started. Let's say, for example, it's a co-op traffic. Now, while all these things is happening in parallel, you don't know uh, the yet. acknowledgements are you not You don't know started. when. Yes. yes, yes, we, yes. we had that discussion. Yes. Repo doesn't give you that. So, yeah. so you know that the, 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 the state is progressing through the network. You don't know if it reached the destination. So we discussed about, and that could be in one of those drafts that Michael is talking about, but uh, an acknowledgement by the root, you know, all the way down. Okay, now I got it. You could you could add a mechanism like this. Maybe it's one of your slides. Yeah, yeah. So we discussed so, that last time. And yes, yeah. this one I would I would agree with. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so, so essentially, what we so the all the all the observations that we have uh, what we have quoted is in context to Quantiki or right? We also have our own private implementation though, which which ran into similar problems, and then we checked how open sources are handling it, and that's when we actually went ahead and actually included. There are a lot of other things that are not handled properly in open source. We have not quoted those because those are just implementation quirks, you know. So we have not included those points. So what, the easiest way to handle this is, and without much storage uh, requirement or any state uh, requirement, is by having root acknowledge the DAO. This will be much easier. Much the only problem with this approach is that you can't do target uh, aggregated acts. You can't aggregate multiple acknowledgements in the same in the same packet. So you'll have to send an individual because this is essentially unique traffic back from the root to the node. So that is one of the downside. Uh, another problem with, uh, so DAO act, whether it is, Ripple is not very clear on how to handle aggregated targets. It certainly allows handling aggregated targets, but it doesn't do failure handling. What it means is if you have multiple targets in the same DAO, if one of the target fails, what to do? There's no clear explanation. Now there are implementations already which enable aggregated targets by default in the implementations, and it is absolutely impossible to get anything to interrupt the open source implementation at multiple hops. At multiple hops. If you put five nodes on the table, all all are talking to the border router, everything works fine. But the moment you try to scale a little bit, nothing works. That is how it is today. 
handling node reboots. Now this we had a big discussion. Lollipop counter sort of handles again. The point here that I'm trying to make is Lollipop counter requires some sort of persistent storage, even though it is a little uh, very small. Uh, only it is only required for the linear part. It still requires persistent storage if you want to get a uh, uh, if you want to get a deterministic way in which the node can join the network. Deterministic means within a particular time bound, not like in in few milliseconds, but at least in few seconds. It should be possible. Yeah, the, the the primary question here is should deployment provision persistent storage for network stack, even though app does not require any persistent storage. So this is this is a big debate that we had internally inside our uh, deployment solution. Handling resource availability. Now this is the, uh, the, the, this problem is with regard. I think this problem is in a way handled by other drafts now. Uh, it's about neighbor table and routing table getting full, and how to handle it if uh, if 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 the routing table or neighbor table at an upstream node gets full. So how would the downstream node come to know about it and how to handle all the scenarios? I won't go into the details of this because there is some work going on in the context of this uh, discussion. Should transit information be optional? Now, currently the transit information is optional. Transit information contains key elements like path sequence and path lifetime. Parent address for non-storing mode of operation, it is optional. There is no way parent address can be an optional element for non-storing mode of operation. So it has to be mandatory. So uh, the, the, these are some of the points that you know uh, we, we figure. Uh, aggregated target container aggregation can be optional, but at least the reception of aggregated uh, DAO should be made mandatory, so that the implementations care to follow that. How to do it? I mean, this is uh, something that is left to a discussion. But this is uh, th there is some idea that we have proposed here. Maybe some of the work will require separate drafts, like Michael mentioned. Even the acknowledgement draft, acknowledgement work might be a separate draft because it requires a different. It, it, it is a different discussion. Uh, for all the other parts, uh, some uh, the handling resource vulnerability, there is already a work in progress. I feel sixtish the enrollment draft sort of handles it for the sixtish, the rank priority. The same mechanism can be used here in Ripple as well, so, uh, so that it informs the downstream nodes whether there is enough capacity on the upstream path. There, so so our plan was to actually work on these problems, get some data statistics, prove that the control overhead is much large in certain cases, and then come back to the uh, working group. That, that is the way that we had thought about. Uh, one more thing that we wanted to discuss is there are other implications when it comes to multiple link layer, use of multiple link layer technologies. So in, in, in our deployment, we are actually making use of PLC and 802.15.4 in subgigards at the same time. And there are some issues that we saw. One of the issues I mentioned here, but maybe in, uh, I won't go into the details of this problem. Maybe the reason why I've just mentioned here is so that I just want to highlight that should we take into consideration these problems as well, which are related to multi use of multiple link layer technologies at the end. Great. OK, then maybe this is something that we can add to the draft as well. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, Really hope you wrote this as you promised you would. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Raul. Uh, Charlie? How's that? I'm, I'm Charlie Perkins. I'm here to talk about AODV Ripple. Uh, we uh, not too long ago released a uh, update for the draft and so uh, this is in response to comments that were received during last call and I'll just uh, take a couple of slides to go go over that okay. well. so there were some questions about uh, sequence numbers and uh, that was uh, clarified in the draft uh, there was a sort of a it's been uh, mentioned a couple of times they requested why don't we use the DODAG version number in DTSN? Uh, well, the main reason was because uh, early on when the draft was uh, uh, being done, um, the large part of it, we didn't understand exactly how DTSN was supposed to work. And uh, I asked a couple of people and still didn't get a full understanding. So now I think I do have a better understanding of it. But it still doesn't really seem to be appropriate to use it in the same way uh, because as it's designed uh, within Ripple, because the version number is always zero and and the DTSN is for the DAO and there's not a DAO message in AODV Ripple. 
Well, that's not to say it couldn't be done. Uh, since we have a different uh, mode of operation, we could change the meaning of things and and uh, and use that. But it seems anyway already uh, the sequence number operation is handled well the way it is in the current draft, and and it does what it's supposed to do. So uh, these um, sequence numbers are now well, they're, they're eight bits. So. Um, in the recent draft, it was uh, suggested that we make those into the lollipop counter sorts of for, for the rollover uh, operation. And so that was done. And this uh, discussion that uh, Rahul just had with the lollipop counter, I think, applies in our case too. And so uh, we probably do need to make a further clarification on what the linear part is and, and so on on that. And that, uh, I think, is... But right now, it just refers to the, the, that the lollipop counter is done the same way as it's done in Ripple. So that, that might be good enough, but I think we should uh, be sure about that. And then um, uh, to answer some other questions about uh, how the sequence number um, is used, so the originating node increases the sequence number the same way whenever it wants to find a new route. And uh, that's in the uh, route request DIO message. Also, the, our originating node can uh, put in a target sequence number, which is meant to say that it's not interested in getting routes unless the sequence number is greater than what it already has for the target sequence node. And that uh, is intended to um, eliminate the possibility of accepting route updates for uh, uh, operations where the packets are still somehow um, being forwarded in the uh, in the network. This is all pretty much modeled on the way AODB did it in the RFC thirty five sixty thirty five sixty one, and also uh, AODB version two, which is uh, currently under review. But um, so that's uh, that's how that's supposed to work. And then the intermediate routers. Uh, also follow pretty much the same uh, sort of philosophy. They only use, uh, they only update their route entries when the sequence number is greater. And finally, the target node uh, includes its uh, sequence number in the route reply when it uh, um, sends a route reply back to the uh, originating node. Another uh, I, one thing that I didn't put in the slides, but I, I'd at least like to mention is that there was, uh, in the uh, earlier, uh, it was requested that AODV Ripple also uh, enable handling of uh, multiple targets. And that was done by having an AODV Ripple target option. And one of the larger editorial changes in this version of the draft was to just, instead of always writing out AODV Ripple target option, now we have the ART option. So that made some of the uh, text a little perhaps easier to read. Um, in addition to that, it was pointed out that our um, uh, lifetime maybe wasn't quite big enough so that the values now uh, for the route lifetime that are, are um, uh, indicated by the L field, which is a two-bit field, have been increased. I'm running out of water in my mouth. Um, so, oh, IETF, and that's really a great organization. Oh, thank you, Chairs. Okay. Um, question? Oh, okay. So uh, the uh, and source routing, this is another feature that was added earlier in response. To, um, a lot of comments were received um, earlier this year and last year about, well, why don't we have some features that were present in RFC 6997? And so now AODV Ripple was improved to handle source routing as well. And so these address vectors only exist at the originating node and the target node. And so um, uh, that's where the route lifetime would be effective. In uh, hop by hop mode, uh, if you have 
routers along the path, then they, uh, the route entries will be updated uh, when they receive route replace, route reply you know, with larger sequence numbers. And if the routers aren't on the old path, then uh, eventually, I mean, on, the, on a new path that's uh, created, but uh, for the, the routers that are not on the new path, then the uh, route entries will just uh, be expired. And um, so that's pretty much the way that uh, works. Also modeled on what was in RFC 6997. So that is um, pretty much it. There wasn't very many changes. If you do a diff between uh, version 4 and version 5, you'll see that it's mostly editorial, uh, especially with this ART nomenclature. And uh, I think that the draft has responded to all the comments that were received during last call, but it could be that there needs to be a little bit more tune-up according to some of the discussion about lollipop counter, counter um, uh, specification and, and so on. So uh, I guess um, we'll take a look at that and see what to do next and maybe we'll be done. I want to look through the document, uh, see if I understand it completely, and uh, probably we may do a last working group, last call then for this document, and then I hope it will be ready. Okay, okay. that's, yeah. I mean, that would be appreciated, and I think we're sort of in last call, but more yeah. last call is... The additions, this, okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem, great. And, uh, yeah, if uh, you email on the list or whatever, you know, get it. thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Aris. Um, I will be presenting uh, our uh, the next of our the next steps in our work for the traffic aware objective function. So, uh, since the previous version. We have uh, changed the um, definition of uh, what the value reported in the metric container was. We used to report the packet transmission rate, which is similar to what uh, Rahul has mentioned in the mailing list. And now we actually report the remaining throughput, and I will explain the difference. Uh, we have also addressed uh, parent selection and daughter selection. And uh, we have uh, defined some configuration values uh, for how to measure the ah there's something there how to measure the uh, used uh, throughput the in order to calculate the remaining throughput uh, and finally we've also uh, described how to use this within enrollment in relation to michael's work so uh, as a quick recap there are multiple objective functions to use in order to pick a preferred parent you have objective function zero which uses a tx and has no doesn't use a hysteresis then you have mr hoff which uses uh, basically any additive metric and uses a hysteresis and there was also a draft which um, is called LBOF, uh, which reported the child count of a parent and used hysteresis in order to do load balancing. Now, um, the problem that uh, we're trying to solve here uh, is uh, related to load balancing. So uh, we have nodes which are uh, overloaded and you might actually have DODACs which are uh, overloaded in terms of traffic, which leads to uh, a lower uh, lifetime for the network and the uh, nodes because the energy consumption is not smoothly uh, distributed. And depending on scheduling, you can also have higher packet losses or, and higher packet delay uh, due to extra queuing on the nodes. So what we propose here is a, a combination of an extra uh, metric called remaining throughput and uh, an objective function. For the metric, uh, we use it in aggregated mode with a minimum function, and uh, it basically does uh, tracking as the node operates of how much throughput has been used, how much forwarding a node has been using uh, within a specific window of time, uh, here configured through a variable. And then uh, if you know 
how much uh, capacity for doing uh, forwarding you have. You subtract what you have used out of that and you get the remaining throughput. So that, that's basically a metric of how much space you have extra for sending data uh, around. Uh, in addition, we also define an objective function which basically picks uh, the node with uh, the highest remaining throughput as a preferred parent and you can also do a, a hysteresis like Mr. Hoff to uh, limit how much switching of parents you do. And there's a small example of a DIO here and we basically add this within the DAG metric container and here is an example of the remaining throughput so you, it's just a normal metric object uh, we request the, a new type for the routing MC type uh, it's noted that we need to use the minimum function in the agri in the A field and it's basically two octets, two, two bytes, which uh, report the number of packets sent within the, the last throughput period. So this is quite similar to Rahul's work. Uh, the only difference is that uh, we report the remaining throughput, not the used throughput, and I will show in a few examples now. So in this case, uh, on the left hand, it's the same network on both sides. On the left hand side, you have the unbalanced network on the right one, the balanced one. And in this case, uh, all the leaf nodes, the ones, is there a laser here? Yes. Uh, the leaf nodes down here all uh, require the same traffic. It's one packet per second as an example. Um, as you can see, A here has a, a total throughput available of two packets per second, which it, it can handle, and B as well. However, since it has three children, it's overloaded, whereas B has some spare capacity. So if you want to balance this, one of the three nodes here, C1 to C3, needs to move over to the B as parent. Uh, now, in this case, the LBF uh, objective function would work quite well because it, ha it just so happens that you have the same number of... Uh, it, it, the, all the children have the same uh, throughput requirements. However, in this next example, if all the children, all the leaf nodes don't have the same traffic requirements, then LBF won't work. So in this case, for example, uh, A uh, has some spare capacity and uh, B is overloaded because this uh, child requires three packets per second. So in this case, you'd basically need D2 to remain with B and D1 to switch over here so that both are within capacity. We also have some examples relating to Dodak selection. So in this case, uh, you have a node C which is trying to pick a Dodak to join to. And you have two Dodaks, one and two. Uh, both of them are within capacity, but one is right on the limit. So it can handle four packets per second, and it is actually using four packets per second right now. Now, if you don't have this remaining throughput information, you, what will happen is that you might pick Dodag one to connect. And in this case, you're over capacity. And it, if you don't use RT, use ETX or something like that, maybe after some time you'll realize that you're losing, you're getting some packet loss and uh, you will switch to the other one, but it will take some time to do that switch. Yes, sorry. Pascal here. Mm -hmm. um, Should I go back? Is, throughput is a very dangerous metric to be used in a routing protocol with none that's in SARPANET. So it's kind of not new news because you tend to to create oscillations in your network. I mean, like this guy advertises more capacity, people, everybody moves to the side. And, and then, then obviously the capacity is bloated and so everybody moves to the other guy and bang, bang, bang. So um, I, I, I don't th see that you can do a lot better than ARPANET in a distributed fashion if you stick to the idea of a preferred parent or, or just one next hop. So the knowledge of throughput is very useful, but it's useful to slowly rebalance across multiple parents. So if you have those parents and you use them like this, and you see that one has a bit more capacity, then you, you move a little bit of your traffic to that parent, but just a little bit at a time, and then you see how the whole network 
rebalances. And then if there's still more capacity to aim, you switch a little bit more traffic. But you keep using all your parents. Otherwise, you're in ARPANET. And your, your, your network will bang, 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 oscillate. So, so as long as you present it like you do with just a reparent. So you think that a hysteresis function won't be good enough for this? To I, I, control these uh, abrupt changes? Uh, I, I think you need to avoid oscillations. I think that you need to use multiple parents in parallel if you mm -hmm. use that metric, not just one. Okay. Uh, and, and slowly adapt and see what your change does, etc. So, so that you go from a, a stable state to a different stable state, mm -hmm. as opposed to create wide oscillations. Okay, so as far as I can tell, your uh, objection is not so much uh, on the idea of carrying this information uh, as to how the objecting function will use it, or yeah. how the, each node will right. exactly. use this information. Exactly, I agree with the information we wanted. I don't agree on the behavior which would be change your default, your preferred parent, and send all mm -hmm. the traffic to the preferred parent. Okay. Um, do you think there's a meaningful way for a node to know how to switch this information? So it will have to have an idea of how to split its traffic around, right? Exactly. It's, it's a load balancing thing that you slowly tune. So it's mm. Ripple gives you a DAG, right? So you have multiple parts. This is a metric that comes in a world where you use all those parts and, and, and you tune different facets. That's, that comes with it. So it's, it's a cool thing to do in RIP because of those multiple parts, mm -hmm. but don't, don't do up on that. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, now I have the rest of the presentation using this, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so one of the issues it relates, uh, it's actually good that we finished this because one of the things that we are discussing, the, the, the next one it relates to Dodak selection with multiple metrics. So in this case, for example, uh, you have uh, multiple Dodaks to pick, uh, be, uh, to, to choose one of the Dodaks. So for example, here you have a pledge node in the middle and it has to pick between three Dodags. And uh, the three Dodags have uh, different remaining capacities, uh, but each of the potential parents this pledge node can connect within those Dodags have different ETX values. So if you, you can use a combination of uh, two metrics, for example, with highest priority being the remaining throughput and second priority being uh, the ETX, and um, using that, you can pick both the, be the best, the highest uh, remaining throughput and the lowest ETX. So if you do that, for example, in this case, the highest um, remaining throughput is in Dodag 1. And within the two children that are accessible here, it's uh, node B, which has the lowest ETX. Uh, however, it might be interesting to check uh, whether you want to filter out some values of ETX, or maybe ETX7 is too high. So then you also add a, a constraint in the metrics, and you tell it, you know what, if uh, I need to only pick uh, a parent which has uh, an ETX lower than 7. And that means that these two nodes are filtered out because they both have an ETX uh, 7 or above. And then from the remaining options, from this Dodag and this Dodag, you pick Dodag 2 with C being the highest value. Now the problem is that you might actually be too restrictive in your filter. And in this case, if you use an ETX of lower than 5, for example, then both of these Dodags are filtered out and you only end up with this Dodag. However, this one has um, no remaining capacity. And in this case, it would make sense to use a, uh, an optional constraint, in which case you would do some uh, extra backtracking and use uh, a Dodak which normally doesn't cover the constraints. However, it does have a valid value for a remaining throughput. We also handle uh, enrollment in, in the new version of the draft. So uh, one of the interesting things is that while uh, what um, Pascal said does make a lot of sense, maybe it, it's not that important for the join process itself. So for the once join process, you might want to directly use the best parent. I, I don't know if he agrees. 
so for the enrollment process for layer two, uh, we have uh, defined how you would convert the remaining throughput into the pan priority field that Michael describes. Um, since the pan priority value is basically opaque, uh, we don't really require, it's not really important that you require the exact remaining throughput, it's just a relative value between different products. So in this case, we've decided to use a log function because the remaining throughput is a 16-bit value and we need to compress the somewhat smaller value. So we take a log uh, on it and uh, we convert it into the pri uh, pan priority by doing a subtraction so that lower, uh, so that a higher value of RT turns into a lower value of pan priority. Um, using the log function actually helps that we have higher accuracy in the lower values of uh, remaining throughput. So there's a bigger difference between uh, if you have a remaining throughput of one versus a three, whereas for higher values of remaining throughput, it doesn't make us a big difference. And uh, while I know that um, it's not generally a good idea to implement uh, such complicated, uh, complicated functions, at least for this case, you can implement it with a, a bunch of shifts and ors and a lookup. So it should be efficient enough. Uh, finally, something that we've already mentioned, the enrollment for Ripple. So uh, again, as this example shows, we can use it for picking Dodags as well. So one is for layer two and one is for layer three. So finally, we've, uh, we've, have some, we've had a review by Derek and we have uh, addressed comments in that. We have presented a paper in a, a conference in 2008 and we have a Contiki implementation which is very close to release for this draft. So I would like to ask what the next steps would be if someone else would be willing to review the draft or if there's changes we should make and what the path, if any, for adoption would be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, someone willing to review this document? Okay, thank you. Yeah, too. So thank next you. test would be like address what Pascal say mm -hmm. and go for adoption. And? Go for adoption. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is George uh, from Yemen Atlantic, and today I will uh, present you some updates. Basically, it will be simulations that we run, set of simulations, and I will show you some results on the draft that we are working on, uh, on NSA extension. So we got uh, reviews from Diego during the previous days. So thank you, Diego. I'm not sure if he's online. Uh, so we uh, um, it was like polishing, stylishing uh, comments on the draft. So the 0.3 version applied these Diego comments. And the second point that I will, I will focus today is about the results that we run since uh, ITF 2, uh, 102. Uh, I'm not sure if I have time. I will go through briefly uh, what is the concept of this draft, and then I will show you the, uh, the results. So basically what we have here is uh, to employ PRE over 60s, 60s network. And the objective is to bound the delay and to provide uh, reliable communication. And to do so, we have these three operations, the replication, elimination, and the overhearing procedure. So basically we have the uh, replication when uh, S sends his uh, data packet to his uh, preferred parent, and then he replicates the same information to his uh, alternative parent. And then elimination procedure is at the reception site when the device once it receives the original packet and then he receives its uh, duplication, he will uh, eliminate this uh, copy. While the third operation is the overhearing. This, uh, thanks to uh, nature of the wireless communication, when S transmits to A, B may overhear this uh, 
transmission and vice versa. When S will replicate the packet to B, A may over here, thus we double the opportunities for the packet to go up in the Dodak. So uh, in this draft, we propose uh, a way how to select the alternative parent, and we define to select alternative parent based on common ancestor. And here is the example. So basically, in this use case, S will select B as an alternative parent because they are having common ancestor, which is D. So D is the uh, preferred parent of a preferred parent of S. So we call it grandparent. And apparently, D it is within the parent set of B. So B is a good candidate for S to be as an alternative parent. To do so, we need to update the DIO uh, control packets, where within the metric container we and within the NSA option, we define a TLV called PS, parent set, and within this parent set, we list set of IPv6 addresses, where the first one is the um, is the preferred parent. So for S, for instance, sorry, for A, when A will forward this uh, DIO, when A will, yes, will send this DIO packet, we will have three IPv6 addresses, where first will be its uh, default parent, the preferred parent, and CE will be the uh, parent set. I will go quickly from this slide where we have the example of the DIO format, then we go to DAG MC type two. And then the next slide here is our NSA option where within this we define PS parent set type where we have this uh, set of IPv6 addresses or compressed thanks to Michael's comment from last or two ITF meetings. So, uh, so far we implemented three different uh, versions of, uh, of uh, common ancestor uh, uh, alternative parent selection. And the first one we call it strict, where uh, the alternative parent for S will be only the device that has a common explicit uh, preferred parent. Basically, my grandparent will be the uh, preferred parent for my potential alternative parent. In this case, it's valid only for B2, because B2 has as a preferred parent F, which is my direct grandfather. So this is called strict mode. Then we have the medium mode, which basically says that uh, my grandparent, my the preferred parent of my preferred parent, will be within the parent set of my potential alternative parent. So to give you uh, some examples, so apart from B2, B3 can be uh, my potential alternative parent, because F, which is my preferred parent of my preferred parent, it is within the parent set of B3. So B3 consists of F and G. So in the medium version, uh, B3 can be an uh, option to choose as an alternative parent. And finally, we have this relaxed version. It basically is uh, intersect of two parent sets. So basically, if any of my uh, uh, if any of the parent set of my preferred parent is within its overlaps with the prefer with the parent set of my potential alternative parent, then this alternative parent can be uh, my alternative defined as my alternative parent. So in this case, even B1, we have the overlap of E can be potentially my alternative parent. So this is the relaxed mode, and we uh, did not run yet ex uh, experiments with this because it really makes flooding in the network. So, but I will show you some results for our two previous uh, options. So here we run a set of uh, simulations. So in the, in the, on the left side, we have this default ripple with a single parent. And then we have two packet replication elimination uh, options. So the first one here is, uh, again, the default uh, version of the ripple, where the default parent and the alternative parent are selected by default based on the best two rank uh, parents. And then we have uh, the uh, option, packet replication elimination, CA we call it, common ancestor, with a strict mode. So the result shows that definitely PRE improves uh, the reliability when you compare to default uh, Ripple. And little bit, the PRE, we call it here ETX, it's better than the strict CA by 2%, but there's a cost to pay for this, and the cost is the, for instance, in this case, the number of devices that the single packet traversed in the network, 
meaning that how many devices this single packet went through based on these uh, duplications. So you can see here we this uh, PRE with ETX went through more than 14 devices. Yes. Peter van der Stok, just an illuminating question for me. Does the simulation uh, take into account failing links or are all the links uh, up and running for 100%? They are the links more than 70%, yes. Okay. Between 17 to 100, so there's a variable links. Thank you. Um, and then in this slide, you will see when you uh, the cost that you have when you traverse too many devices. So the more you traverse the devices, so the more you duplicate, as you can see that with a common ancestor, we have a difference of more than 40% in terms of the duplications in the network. So basically, it's the unnecessary net, uh, packets that we save when you run uh, this packet replication elimination with common ancestor algorithm. So what we wanted to do next is to uh, see how it works in the, uh, in the topology here. This is a snapshot of uh, default uh, ripple with single parent, with single path. So it's, this is nothing, no surprise here. And then we have this packet replication elimination with uh, based on default ripple with two best parents, basically. And you can see here the level of the flooding that you have in the network, right? And of course, this improves the reliability, but you pay the cost in terms of the energy and duplication that you have in the network. And then the uh, the solution, the the uh, scheme that we propose here, the CA strict. You can see the ladder topology that we have here. We achieved so you have these two parallel paths. To until the destination, but the only issue is that sometimes we may end up not having the alternative parent. So this is when we running CA strict, because not always uh, the two potential parents are and having the, their common parents. Like th thus, you don't have sometimes uh, alternative parents. So this is not always, but sometimes we have this case. Now to avoid this case, we thought to run the uh, medium CA. So the second version of the common ancestor. And our results shows pretty interesting results. So you can see that we improved the reliability. We even overpass, surpassed the uh, packet replication elimination with it based on ETX. So we have really good PDR, but we pay the cost as well. So the cost is we increased uh, the number of devices that we went through, traversed in order to get the packet to the destination which eventually uh, we pay the cost in terms of energy because we have uh, more transmissions, we have more duplications. But in order to somehow mitigate this problem, we discussed with Pascal back in uh, Adoc Now conference in, uh, in September. Uh, the idea is that to avoid having this problem here, to have too many um, devices that forward the same information. So the idea was if you end up in a use case where you have only one device in the network, we, in, we introduce a bit in the packet so that we will uh, allow to move from the strict mode to the medium mode. Um, and th actually this, this use case helped us. So basically every time we call it this strict to medium. So all devices are around CA strict mode. And once we allow the devices, when they are having trouble not finding the alternative parent, they, we allow them once in the network to switch to uh, medium CA to find the alternative parent if they cannot, to open the branch, basically. Uh, so by doing so, we improved, we, we improved the uh, PDR. We somehow mitigated the number of devices that we went through. And this helped us to reduce by 14%, more than 14% the duplications in the network. So this is ongoing work. So these results we got like two days ago. So we are still working on even more to improving this, to put some intelligence, how to reduce even more these uh, duplications. Okay, so that's all uh, I think that we have so far. So road forward. Uh, so yes, this work was presented last for ITF. We have partial code online. So we have the, uh, the Contiki version of the NS extension. You will have here the link. We have these Wireshark detectors for the TLVs. It's online as well. We got reviews. So this is good for us now from Diego and from Derek. We want more. 
Something uh, interesting, we start uh, using uh, this in uh, education as well. So we first did a tutorial uh, this year in GIS conference of two hour tutorial. We had 25 to 30 attendees. It was quite interesting discussion later. And we are using PRE in our teaching. So at our school, we are employing six to nine hours of teaching on contiguous with lab sessions. So it's quite interesting for the students as well. And then we have some research on both conferences and journals. Here's some credits to uh, all guys who helped us so far. Yes. Uh, Rahul Jadok from Huawei Technologies. Uh, my first question is uh, regarding, uh, uh, regarding how do you apply PRE only for the subset of traffic? For example, I might have maybe 1% of traffic where I am OK with to induce uh, such kind of energy cost so that uh, I, I can have more, I can use this technique on I, basically my point is I want to use this technique only for the subset of traffic. Okay. How do I do that? Because there is a cost in war. This is my first we, question. We did not touch yet. So what we do for so far, it was like for all our traffic, mm -hmm. but it's a nice point. We can yeah. try to do this uh, for our partial uh, traffic as well. We did not try yet. Pascal here. Okay, so this, this PRE uh, inherits from work which has been done in DetNet and things like that, and certainly DetNet uh, identifies the flows for which a particular attention needs to be taken, and PRE itself has a header that indicates like a sequence number and and uh, so that you can eliminate replication and and which flow it is and this sort of thing. So this is this is about how you can transport this in the network, but obviously there will be something else which is not this draft which will indicate whatever is needed to do replication elimination etc. And this is why we have this PO discussion on Thursday, right? How do we enable mechanisms to get better results on wireless, which take us closer to the spirit of deterministic networking, even if people won't like to call wireless deterministic for a number of psychological reasons. Um, still, we want to get similar benefits on wireless as we do on wires with deterministic. And so power is all about this, and this is one of the ways to, 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 to do it. So it just shows you as an example that there are things we could do at the IETF which would allow a more deterministic use, more deterministic delivery of your packets. Um, and, and that is nothing to do with IEEE, right? It's, it's really an IETF problem here that we can... So PO we, Thursday 11. I mean, in this, in this paper, uh, maybe I will show you some results uh, in the next IETF. In this journal, we show that we bound the delay to 15 milliseconds. The jitter, excuse me. So the, the, the experiments were done as part of Kuja, I believe. Yes. Uh, look, I feel personally, in my opinion, I cannot use Kuja for such kind of experience uh, experiments. You know, where it does not have realistic error. If you do the same experiment in NS3 or Castalia, you'll have a different result altogether. That I'm very much sure about. OK, so uh, uh, so if I heard it correctly, are you saying that the actual, actual data traffic will, the forwarding plane will have some sort of IPv6 extension header inserted in it so as to know what flow it belongs to as part of? OK, all right, okay, that, I got it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Giorgio. Uh, who has read the draft? Okay, uh, who, uh, who is willing to review the draft? Okay, Raul, thank you. Um, just uh, based on this presentation, Raul, Raul. No one else? Okay. Uh, based on this presentation, uh, we would like to know what do you think about the, if we should adopt this document? So please, Ham. Against? <laughs> reasons? The reason? So th there are there are sorts of traffic now that we are seeing in the AMI space, which um, is more in the control area than in the pure metering, right? So so those networks now that we deploy are going beyond pure metering and need more reliable uh, transport for some more control type of activity. 
And for those things, actually, our customers are asking something like storing mode and something like deterministic. And we cannot really give either of them, but we can approach that. And this is typically a technique that can help approach determinism on those networks. So, so it's actually something we need in the field. So that's why I'm humming. Um, for, for, for the um, storing mode, that, that's really where this uh, fraud projection comes in because mm -hmm. the current means we could not do storing mode in large scale. So we, we came up with, with uh, rod projection, but uh, for reliability, we need something like that. And actually, if you think about combining this with rod projection, then you could project two rods and decide to do PRE over those two rods. Kind of, that's one, uh, what, one example of things. So you, instead of having to discover those two paths like we do automatically, now if you combine this with rod projection, the controller could decide the two paths and the, this decide all the crossing thing. So, so that there is there is a way in front of us to provide more deterministic behaviors on those networks. So that that's that's what's behind all this. Thank you. Oh, I, I'm Charlie Perkins. I I don't have a, a, a actually opinion for or against, but I was just a little bit surprised about the technique for picking out effectively grandparents. I mean, if um. you, is it? So, the, the, the reason behind this technique is to uh, avoid the first flooding. So the idea is we want to keep as close as to the main path that you pick up from the uh, ripple, uh, yeah, based on the ripple and the rank. So we try the alternative pattern to be always close enough to this path so that we avoid this flooding in the network. As you can see, maybe in this figure, we want to avoid this, basically. So you, uh, you want to have sort of narrowly constrained flooding, yes. and in order to do that, you want to exert some control over the grandparents. Yes. And then presumably, as part of the mechanism, the grandparents exhibit control over their grandparents. Or yes. Yes. So exactly. This is what we. But this, that, that, no, that we want to achieve this basically. So that, more or less. that seems to make a lot more sense when you have twenty-five nodes in a square array. But I'm not sure how it fits into a, an actual network. Meaning? I, I don't know. You need the you need the density to be able to select that parallels. Yes. So if you should look for events enough, then you can So here you have network out, out degree maybe like as much as nine. Yes. So, so. There, there is a density where these things make sense and basically the whole benefit of meshing is that you have multiple possibilities. And if, if you have multiple possibilities, then hopefully you get you get them all the way through to the root. And if you get that, think about it for a minute, right? Radio is lossy. So you're, you're sort of thinking, hey, can I use radios for my application if it's kind of uh, important for me, right? And on the other hand, if you realize that radio has this benefit that there is more than one guy who can hear you when you talk, and you can use that other specific thing of radio to balance the first one. On the one hand, you, you, talking to just one person is lossy, but in the other hand, other people can other people can hear you, which which gives you extra receive. Can you balance those two? Can the solution of the prime one be found in the same behavior of the radio, um, which is the fact that multiple people can receive you? And can you balance that? That's exactly what we are doing here. So at the end of the day, we get a reliable transmission because we balance the lossiness with the fact that multiple people can receive you. So you must get away from the wired paradigm of this hop and then this hop and then this hop and start thinking in, I'm progressing like a wave from A to B. And what we are doing exactly is, is what Charlie said, we are kind of constraining how this progression happens. You don't really care if it progresses like through those guys or through those guys, but you're, you're kind of building a multi-lane way between you and the root. And you could use at each hop any of those lanes to progress. But you're progressing like a wave inside this waveguide that we are building here. Not a what? A wave, not a particle. Yes, a wave, not a particle. <laughs> it's a field. <laughs> Everything is a field. <laughs> so, so in this field, 
So, but that's exactly what you're doing, right? You're progressing like a wave across this medium, which is this. If, if you think like a, a one hop and then one hop and then one hop, if you think wire, then you end up with a very lossy medium. If you think like a radio, now you can be reliable again. Make radio great again. Well, I, uh, close, I, I won't uh, belabor the closest, point. Closest that, to the mic. Are we done? Maybe you can take your mic oh, yeah. okay. So I, I don't want to belabor the point. It's probably better on the mailing list, but I think it would be better to show some more general simulations. And also, there has been a lot of um, work done on what's called backup routes. In other words, instead of having one path through, you have a couple that maybe are relatively close tracked, controlled by the metric. And yeah, okay, so thank you. Hi, this is Aris here. Uh, so two points. One, uh, regarding DAO projection, so this solution is basically uh, refers to when you don't have a, a central controller which can define your route. So if you don't have that available, this is basically the best you can do, right? Um, the second thing is, as far as the draft is uh, concerned, we, Georges has presented more simulation and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, the draft just proposes another optional TLV inside the NSA metric container. So the, the size of the draft is very constrained. And I would like to ask if, um, if it would make sense to add more of the PRE stuff inside it, or if it makes sense to remain like a relatively focused thing on just this extension. Okay, thank you for the comment, Ari. Uh, you want to? Yes, I, I will skip that one, I guess, because we don't have much time. <laughs> so, yes, we just have five minutes. So the road projection did not progress much because I didn't get much review on it. So um, let, let's, I mean, please look at it, give us reviews so we can progress because for the time being, it's, it's kind of stuck. Um, so we'll just keep that, and you will see there are many slides here for those who are, who are not so familiar with it, on how it works and what happens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The whole thing is the DAO projection is taking repo into the SDN world. You have a controller, you can establish a storing mode along non-storing path to to compress the the routing headers, and you can establish uh, horizontal tunnels so as to bypass. Uh, between the source and destination, avoiding the going all the way up to the common part. And with this, I will go straight to unaware, uh, Ripple unaware leaves. Oh, okay, go well, four minutes. So giving you news, there are three things really that this draft does and a number of things that it does not. And what I would like the group to tell me is what, what we want in this draft and what we don't want in this draft. So right now, what the draft is doing is very simple. You've got this host. It's not Ripple aware. We are using RFC 6775 update for a leaf node, which is not aware of Ripple, to register to Ripple for unicast transmissions. And that's where Torless needs to, to think about it for a minute, because that's, that's the, the point you made, and I'm confirming it. We are using this just to advertise an IPv6 address between a host and a router, so the router can do ripple on behalf of the host. We don't do multicast. So if you if you want to do multicast, the idea today is you use MLD, the way it works. And that's how you would register a multicast address. Now the router, based on that, on MLD or this, could turn the IP address registration into a bit if it's aware of beer and advertise that all the way up as, as a beer thing as opposed to a multicast address in Ripple or unicast address in Ripple. That would be one way, and that, that's what uh, we called kind of uh, tunnel mode or something. Well, anyway, that, that, that's because you had so many names, but that's when the leaf is not aware of beer at all. If the leaf is aware of beer, then we would need an extension there to signal the bit from the leaf to the router, which does not exist today. Uh, less, I have four minutes for my whole presentation. <laughs> but I'm, ju I'm just two, right. So basically this draft here, this RFC 6775 update, is how you register this unicast address all the way to the 6LBR, which is or not the Ripple route, and that's yet again a discussion we need to have. And all the way back. 
So for the time being, we have separated the concept in this draft, we have separated the concept of 6LBR, which is a 6 loop concept, and, and what Toll has called the 6RR, the ripple root. But in, if you read 6 Lopan, it says it's the same thing. It's just that 6 Lopan did not specify what it would be. For the, the leaf, uh, the, this unaware draft, I, I had to design the flow between the 6 LBR and the 6 RR and the ripple root. And this is an extra complexity that we may not want. So there's, that's really something that I want you guys to react upon. Do we consider that the ripple root is always the 6 LBR? Is it by definition the same, the same guy? If it is, then, then there are some flows in this draft that we can just avoid. Now, if we want for some reason to keep them separate, then the flows that are in the draft are useful. Okay. Um, then, so, so like I said, this, this uh, 6575 that we depend upon is now in the RFC editor queue. We'll, we'll get the RFC number like before Christmas. So that's good news because we depend on it so that this dependency will be uh, open. Now there is another draft which comes with it. It's called uh, uh, APND, it's the address protection. So this thing allows the savvy properties in, in 6 loop and ND, meaning that if somebody forms an address, advertises it, then somebody else cannot steal it, cannot come and say, I'm him, and attract the traffic and source traffic on behalf of the other guy. With, with the savvy properties that APND is bringing in, we will be able to filter the attacks at the edge of the network. So if you have a leaf which is not ripple aware and that wants to steal the address of somebody else and get it ad uh, advertised in the ripple network, the 6LR at the edge can filter that with APND. It's a crypto mechanism to avoid that. But this mechanism is just valid at the edge. So if you really trust your Ripple network, we're all set. But if you think somebody could sneak in your Ripple network and start advertising addresses on behalf of the 6LN, then this attack would be possible. And so my question, my second question to the group here is do we want to extend not only RFC 6775 with an aware leaf, but also APND? Meaning add mechanisms in Ripple that would prevent an attacker to inject an address that is not below it on behalf of a, a 6LN which is somewhere else in the network. So do we want to extend the proof of ownership that we do in 6 loop and ND in repo? That's, that would be my biggest question. And after that, I can pretty much go through. Could you ask these questions on the mailing list? Because I think at this moment, it will be very difficult to react to you in 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I can. Yeah. So, so basically, I asked two questions. First, do we need to force that the repo route is the 6 LBR or not? If, if they are not the same, there is extra cost in signaling when the node gets in. So do we really want that, that craziness? I've actually shown how it would go, would work, but I want to get rid of it. Second thing is, do we want to protect Ripple inside Ripple against attacks? So somebody gets the keys of the realm, is, is capable to inject routes in the network. Do we want to get to use the fact that we have APND with the leaf to actually protect the leaves that are registered so that a, a rogue ripple router would not be able to inject the leaf which is not there. Questions to group. Would, would, is, is that logically part of this draft? Thank you very much, Pascal. Well, we are going. Okay, for one question, there is a ticket already open, but it will be nice to put that uh, questions into the mailing list. How? Peter say. Okay. Okay, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, we conclude the meeting. Thank you.